and welcome to Leadership PRN. This is the Dalhousie Faculty of Medicine's podcast for leaders both emerging and established. My name is Dr. Lara Hazelton, and I'm one of the co-directors of faculty development within the Faculty of Medicine. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me Dr. Jennifer Hall. Hi, Jennifer. Hi, Lara. So, Jennifer, you and I know each other from working together at the Faculty of Medicine over the last number of years. I'm wondering, though, if you could introduce yourself for our listeners who may not be familiar with the contributions that you've made. Thanks, Lara. Um, my name's Jennifer Hall. I'm a retired family physician and uh, have just completed my role uh, as Associate Dean Dalhousie Medicine, New Brunswick. And how many years were you in that position for? I was in that position for nine years, uh, Lara. Uh, it seems like it was just a minute ago, but uh, <laughs> it has been uh, nine long years wow. and, uh, <laughs> and wonderful years. And maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what your role involved when you were working for DMNB. Sure. Well, the Associate Dean Dalhousie Medicine New Brunswick's role is essentially to oversee the activities of the medical school in New Brunswick. So my responsibilities were in undergrad, postgrad, research, faculty development, and um, external relationships of the university uh, within New Brunswick. And so I was able to liaise um, with all the folks in Halifax who had leadership positions in particular areas and work with them to ensure that um, activities for students, staff, and, and residents in New Brunswick were quite similar to what those in Nova Scotia would experience. And can you tell us a little bit about um, what the medical education system is in New Brunswick? Um, so you mentioned that there is a liaison with Nova Scotia, but I think there's a number of sites in New Brunswick as well that are quite involved in medical education. That's true, Lara. And medical education in New Brunswick has really grown over the past number of years. Dalhousie Medicine New Brunswick was started in 2010, but that wasn't actually the first part of the story. The first part of the story goes back into the 1950s when uh, residents, interns at the time actually, uh, came to New Brunswick, especially to St. John, to do uh, a lot of their training. Over the years, the complexity of the medical education grew in New Brunswick, whereby clinical clerks came from Nova Scotia to do some of their rotations in New Brunswick. And then a family medicine residency site was started in Fredericton, which was then followed by one in Moncton and then one in St. John. And then after that, we had uh, the internal medicine residency program uh, start in St. John, and followed by a novel integrated family medicine emergency medicine program in St. John. And things have just continued to build from there. So as I said, in 2010, uh, Dalhousie Medicine New Brunswick welcomed their first class of 30 students. And on the postgrad side, we've had expansion of the family medicine program starting this year in Miramichi. We have had internal medicine program expand such that there's now a New Brunswick regional site of the internal medicine program based in Moncton. And we continue to have residents from other Royal College programs do some of their training in New Brunswick from a variety of disciplines. And that has just increased over the, over the past number of years. In fact, I did two months at least in St. John as a resident back in the 1990s, I think it was 1995, and uh, a month in Moncton, um, two months in Moncton actually. So I guess that that's, you're right, it's been going on for, for quite a while. And it's interesting to hear, Lara, when I talk with people across the country who are involved in 
a variety of, of uh, education leadership positions. Often they will relate to me the time that they spent in New Brunswick as part of a Dalhousie program in years gone by. Yes, I have very fond memories of the houses next to the Moncton Hospital um, where I stayed and and uh, really met some people. And that was one of the things I liked about it was the opportunity to interact with people from other um, programs. Right. And, and New Brunswick has had um, a rich history of a variety of medical programs having involvement in the province. Certainly Dalhousie has been uh, the major player over the years, but not insignificantly has been Memorial on the Anglophone side. And of course, Sherbrooke University has a distributed campus based in Moncton on the Francophone side and a residency program in family medicine and psychiatry based there as well. So for a very small province, there is a large complexity of medical education activities that are occurring here. How did you prepare to be a leader? Were there courses that you took, experiences that you had, um, books that you read? Good, good question, Lara. I guess a lot of it was experiential. And I, as I was thinking about this, I remembered uh, my experience as a chief resident in my family medicine program at Memorial. And I think that that opportunity allowed me to look at areas of leadership and and more importantly watch mentors as they participated in leadership opportunities and so uh, following following my residency program as i got into being a preceptor i took on students and then i got involved in in the medical education aspect of the residency program this was in Newfoundland where I did my, my training. And eventually that allowed me to take on the role of program director in Newfoundland for family medicine, which was, which was a wonderful experience. I do remember uh, going to a conference that was put on by uh, an American group, and it was essentially women in academic medicine. And although it was a, just a two-day conference, there were a number of areas that were highlighted there around work-life integration, around what do you give up in order to pursue things that are really positive from a, a leadership training perspective. And that really um, gave me the energy and the some of the tools to be able to start building. And so as I finished up my role and as program director in Newfoundland and moved to New Brunswick, then I then I started looking at opportunities in New Brunswick um, that also I felt uh, I had some ability to contribute to. There were other courses along the way, but again, I'll go back to saying having strong mentors who really believed in, in one's ability to pursue these opportunities was, was probably the, the most important thing in my career development. So who were some of your mentors? So uh, some of my mentors uh, included uh, Dr. Bill Eaton, who was a family doctor in Newfoundland. He had a, a very unique approach, which was largely based on humor, to um, encourage development. And I'm always grateful for, uh, to him for uh, pushing me to, to do some of the things that may have been outside my comfort zone. I have had a number of sort of peer mentors, I'd say, and, and one would be Dr. Preston Smith, who uh, was a family physician in, in Moncton, who, um, 
who had various leadership roles at Dalhousie and uh, that went on to be the Dean of Medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. And he allowed me to talk through things and figure out the answers myself and was very tolerant of me saying, don't tell me the answer. I just need to talk it through. And so I really appreciate that. The other one I would say is Dr. David Anderson, who has really allowed the role of Associate Dean Dalhousie Medicine in New Brunswick to flourish. Under his mentorship, I feel that I've been provided the opportunity to contribute broadly to the Faculty of Medicine. And I felt it was okay for someone from a distributed environment to to have significant influence over the activities in the Faculty of Medicine. And so those are some of the folks, and there are many, who uh, just allowed me to, to explore these things as my career progressed. One of the other um, innovations or levels of complexity is the LIC program. Um, Our listeners may not be familiar with how that works in New Brunswick. I don't know if you could maybe say a few words about that. Sure. Uh, The LIC program, or Longitudinal Integrated Clerkship Program, is a way that Med3 students do their core clerkship, but instead of going from discipline to discipline in a block rotation format. They work with uh, family physicians and Royal College consultants over a period of 44 weeks um, in an integrated way. So they are based usually in a family medicine practice. And um, during the course of the week, they spend time in their family medicine practice but also during the week they spend time in other disciplines. And if things go the way they're intended, they can follow patients from their family medicine practice to a a consultant um, encounter, perhaps to surgery, perhaps to interpartum care, um, and then back into their family medicine practice. And this allows them to experience continuity of care and comprehensiveness of care as they're gradually developing their clinical skills as a clinical clerk. And I, I know those have been traditionally outside of St. John and Nova Scotia. We're having more of the clerks in those as well in places like Bridgewater, Cape Breton, and so on. And um, it's very much a, a distributed environment that our our residents and medical students are and faculty are operating in now because it's um, not just uh, major urban centers, it's smaller um, towns and even rural areas. What are some of the aspects of a distributed environment that pose special challenges for leaders, especially maybe education leaders? I think one of the important things that Dalhousie is doing that makes any challenges just something that we need to deal with it is the fact that distributed clinical learning especially is valued. And the reason is we need people to be practicing in rural areas and more distributed areas. And we do know that if we do clinical training in those environments, that we have an increased chance of recruiting people to those areas. So from a leadership perspective, probably the most critical piece is proximity. We we enjoy being able to tap someone on the shoulder um, who's in the office next to us to say, can you do this for me as part of the curriculum? In a distributed environment, that proximity is sometimes a challenge. And so thinking about who are the individuals spread around the Maritimes who are able to provide that type of education is is certainly a challenge and has to be top of mind for leaders um, in that environment. 
there's an extra effort that has to go into place to form relationships because people in whatever department that they're in, whatever discipline and department, um, are often interacting with the people who are right in front of them, um, but less so with others in the distributed environment. And so trying to ensure that those faculty members who are uh, in the distributed environment are valued members of the department are, is absolutely critical. And from the perspective of a distributed leader, making sure I get to know all the folks around New Brunswick was important, but making sure I also got to know the folks in Halifax and in, in the main departments to try and establish those uh, relationships. I think a couple of other uh, challenges are that the faculty in a distributed environment are a fairly heterogeneous group. Um, they have different practice uh, environments. They have different roles and scopes, and their their context is different. So trying to look at how we deliver undergrad and postgrad curriculum uh, in environments that don't exactly look like how they were originally set up is a bit of a challenge. But I think it's an, also an opportunity. And that was one of the reasons why, if I can give you an example, that the integrated family medicine emergency medicine program of, of the CFPC was developed. Um, and that was developed in New Brunswick because we were looking to ensure that residents had the opportunity to train in the environments in which we wanted them to practice. So in addition to learning emergency medicine skills from our eMERGE colleagues in the bigger center in St. John, we also wanted them to learn the eMERGE skills from those in more rural areas such as Miramichi or Upper River Valley. And by integrating the two and allowing them to practice and learn family medicine in those communities as well, uh, we felt that they were better prepared for the practice that we felt uh, would be appropriate. I'm interested in what you said about uh, leaders, whether it's leaders based in Halifax or in St. John or in Sydney or in Miramichi or in Yarmouth, um, that they need to value the faculty members. Um, any suggestions on how leaders can value faculty members? It, it's a question not even just for those outside the major academic center, but maybe specifically, like how can we value those those faculty members so there has been a there has been work that has been done on on looking at what distributed faculty see as valuable and i think certainly some of the things that come top to mind is one is recognizing that they exist including them in activities um, of of the department and also um, having leadership go to them. A lot of uh, programming occurs in the major centers, but having leadership go to these distributed environments, seeing the context, understanding the opportunities and the challenges that are in those environments really helps solidify those um, relationships. I think by doing that as well and increasing those relationships, it becomes clearer that a number of these faculty are deserving of awards that we may not think about because, they're again, the, their proximity is, is not the same as, as some other colleagues. So recognizing that the value that they contribute becomes important. The other thing is remuneration for medical education activities can be quite different from context to context. And although people recognize that not all their activities will ne necessarily be paid activities, having somebody recognize that they are actually contributing and what they're contributing is valuable, even though it's not remunerated, necessarily in the way that we would want it is absolutely critical as well. 
Yeah, I think the payment issue is an interesting one. And it strikes me that leaders may not be able to change that directly, but they might be able to advocate for their faculty members to to be compensated in a, a reasonable way. Yes, most definitely. And the way that they will know how to advocate is really understand the context in which those faculty live and work. So you mentioned that you've been um, associate dean at DMNB for nine years. And I know before that you were also a program director. And I think you've taken on some new leadership roles as well since stepping down from your previous one. Um, Looking back on your years of leadership, what do you wish you had known sooner? I reflected on that question, Lara, because it, it, it is a good one and, and it's a very interesting one. And I thought, what would I have liked to have known? But I really think that the leadership development and the leadership journey has been part of, the, of what has made this a very exciting career. And so... If I had known certain things, maybe I wouldn't have had the benefit of exploring things to get where I needed to go. And that exploration, I think, was, was again, just enjoying the journey as opposed to just trying to get to a destination. And, and so the mistakes that I've made have taught me a lot the relationships that I've been able to build have have taught me a lot as well. And I think probably what what is really important is to say that geography shouldn't be a barrier to leadership development. And I would encourage those who are in a distributed environment to look at um, what, what types of things really are passionate for them and and encourage them to explore without without necessarily worrying about geography. Thanks so much for for speaking with us today, uh, Jennifer. It's been a, a pleasure. And any final um, words to sum up what your perspective has been on on being the associate dean for so long in New Brunswick? Thanks, Lara. I I have really enjoyed that experience, and it has been certainly one of the highlights of my career. And um, I'm I'm just very grateful that that I've had that opportunity, and and uh, will reflect back on many occasions with a smile around uh, what I've been able to and been privileged to experience. Thank you. Well, and thank you for all that you've done for um, Dalhousie Medicine, not just in New Brunswick, but um, throughout the Maritimes over, over the years. And that's another episode of Leadership PRN. If you have a topic you would like to hear uh, discussed or somebody you think I should interview, please feel free to reach out to me at lara.hazelton at nshealth.ca or lara.hazelton at dal.ca. Until next time, take care. <laughs>